start the traditional way. Uh, peace be upon you. So I'm on eight. So I want to talk a little bit about questions of theodicy, questions about the purpose of life, and what I experienced in that regard from reading the Quran the first time as an atheist. Right, I thought it was, might interest you. And, uh, but in order to talk about that, by the way, my wife always says I should outline my talk before starting because I have a tendency to lose my audiences. So I thought I'd start by describing why I was an atheist, because most people have a horrendous misunderstanding of atheism. And a lot of people think it's just motivated by hedonism or greed, you know, hedonism or arrogance or things like that. I think it's deeper than that, very often. And so I would like to explain why I, I think I became an atheist, and then I'd like to talk to you about uh, what I felt the Quran has to say about the existence of man and uh, human humanity and our purpose. And I thought I'd present that against the backdrop of my first reading of the Quran. Does that make sense? <laughs> Sorry, I keep saying it does not make sense, but I teach math and math. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. Well, how should I begin? I guess I'll begin with my mom. An uh, homage to my mom. I like to say that she certainly wasn't the reason why I became an atheist. Uh, my mom was the most beautiful person. Uh, I know she's my mom, and I'm biased. But seriously, she was the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful people I've ever known, if I try to think about that objectively. Uh, she was a very devout Roman Catholic. She was not the type to live her religion on her sleeve, though. She wasn't the, you know, the type to try to push her faith or her religion on anyone else. But she just lived it day by day in her daily life through her actions. She was the most giving and charitable person I've ever known and never asked for any recognition in return. Really, she never, you know, she never really got it, never really wanted it. Uh, she used to work at, the, at 3030 Park Avenue in Bridgeport, Connecticut in a ward for the terminally ill. She was the head nurse on that ward. And uh, when I used to go and pick her up from work at the late night shift, I used to walk down the halls to find her and her patients, her uh, clients used to call me over to their bedside. Now these are people on their way out from life. And they used to call me over and tell me, uh, Jeff, your mother is the most wonderful, the most compassionate person I've met, many of them would say. Uh, I remember when she died, person after person came up to me and described my mom. They said, Jeff, your mother was a true saint. Uh, she was, like I said, she was extremely charitable. When she retired, and she retired because she became quite ill, she couldn't stay off her feet. She had to donate her time five days a week to work at the soup kitchen downtown, a very tough area of Bridgeport, feeding the poor. Uh, she never made a big deal about it. Just one more example. Uh, when she died, I had to help my father with the accounts because my mother took care of that. And they didn't have much money. But just before she died, she had about $30,000 left in her checking account. That's all my parents had for their name. They had to sell their house because the medical bills were driving them on to ruin, I mean, financial ruin. So they had to sell their house. And hopefully, they were going to use some of that money. But in their bank account, they had $30,000 to her name when she died. And about a week before she died, she wrote half of that. She wrote half of that, a check out for half of that to the soup kitchen. She had no idea that she was going to die suddenly of a heart attack one week later. And to write out half of all you have in a charitable donation, I think really says something about a person's religiosity. Not just religiosity, but human kindness. But in any case, of course, you know, as her son, that's not what I remember most about my mom. What I remember most about my mom is how hard, hard she worked to give my four brothers and I, we had no sisters, how hard she worked to give my four brothers and I as normal and as balanced and as happy a life as she could provide us. And that was despite the handicap that we had acquired. And the handicap that we had acquired, I'm sad to say, and you probably already guessed it, was my dad, was my father. I don't know what it was with my father. Can you hear me all right? But my father 
was an extremely volatile man. He was one of the most violent people I've ever met. And he was extremely volatile. He had this inner rage boiling inside him. And he was like a volcano, always ready to erupt. And he erupted far too often. And every night he tried to quell that inner rage with hard, hard drinking. But his alcoholism only made him all the more unpredictable. For he could be, honestly, he could be, we could be at the dinner table and he could be laughing and joking one moment, and then a second later something would trigger it, you'd never know exactly what it was, and then he would interpret something through the contortion of his alcoholism and he would get enraged and he would fly off the handle. And once he, that was triggered, for the next several hours we would have a violence running through that house like you couldn't believe. I used to describe 